It's really a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, uh, great to, to uh, uh, talk, uh, have the opportunity to talk about our research in front of this uh, distinguished audience here. It's a, obviously a little challenge, so I will try to keep most of it fairly general, but give a little bits and pieces to those who are more specialist in the, in the topics of precision medicine. So the, the title is a, a bit broader than, than indicated, precision healthcare in general. And in order to get to this, I will have two introductions. I'll say a few words about the organizations that we have now led, Lena being the co-leader of the Science for Life Laboratory for the past year. Uh, then introduce the concepts of precision medicine, what does it mean in general, show two examples of it, and then speak a little bit about prevention at the end uh, uh, of the talk. So first of all about my background, so the research that I will be describing today has its origins at the uh, FIM Institute for Molecular Medicine at the University of Helsinki where my research group is still uh, active on, now setting up similar types of activities here at the uh, Karolinska and uh, Science for Life laboratory. And what is interesting to both of these organizations is that they are consortium organizations where different institutions and universities get together. Three organizations in Helsinki, four major universities in, in, in Sweden. And uh, that is actually something that I want to promote forward, that this is the type of collaborative research that we want and need to do more uh, in the future. So a few words about the Science for Life uh, laboratory for those of you who do not know that much about it. So SciLife Lab was set up in 2010, uh, the first director being Matthias Hulein, and it became a national organization in 2013. So more than 1,000 researchers and the main task of SciLife Lab is really provide unique and enabling infrastructures, technologies that enable research uh, and, and new capabilities in, in Sweden. Uh, we then also have a template for, for uh, building a collaborative research community among the scientists and the government, as always these days, expects uh, society benefits from such an investment. So SciLife Lab today is organized in 10 different technology platforms and these are the types of technologies that we depend on in today's uh, uh, science increasingly uh, in, in, uh, uh, and, and the distribution of the funding, uh, much of it goes to genomics. I will say quite a few things about genomics today. There's a drug development activity and a whole host of other special uh, entities. We operate in Stockholm and Solna in, in Uppsala, but also elsewhere in the, in the country. And just to put this thing in perspective, so technology drives life science forward. So this is why we would uh, benefit from having such a national infrastructure. The technology is more and more expensive. And also the cycles when we need to renew the infrastructure gets shorter and shorter. In the DNA sequencing era, it's typically three years. And the equipment that you have bought is more or less history. And, and uh, uh, top science requires access to this uh, infrastructure and, and therefore in a small country it makes sense to coordinate this so that not every university needs to make big investments every three years. The other important reason for SciLife Lab and an, a focus for us in the future is that there's more and more data generated on biology and medicine. And, and this data explosion is also something that we have to have ways to, to deal with. And, and this is something that SciLife Lab will try to attack in the, in the future. But now with that introduction that we have the capabilities to do modern molecular precision medicine, what is the precision medicine uh, all about? First of all, it's not something that we have invented. It's something that the whole world is, is gearing up to do. So if you search the internet for the, uh, or the uh, PubMed for the keywords, personalized medicine or precision medicine, it's a huge increase in the number of publications in the past few years. So this is a global trend that is still in the, in the beginning. And in a very simplified version, I mean, this is what uh, today's healthcare is all about. The definition of disease is largely based on anatomical grounds or physiological grounds, such as lung cancer or blood pressure. 
And uh, the, the treatments that we give to patients are also fairly generic in many cases. Increasingly, there are targeted treatments obviously available. And when we try to uh, ascertain risk factors for disease, we try to say what are the risk factors for lung cancer or blood pressure and so forth. But that is sometimes a little bit difficult because in a sense, in most cases, diseases are composed of small uh, subgroups. Uh, and therefore, what used to be uh, lung cancer, what used to be uh, a, a blood pressure, is, is a, a whole slew of different subgroups of diseases which have their different etiology and, and which have a, a different optimal treatment. So we need to uh, divide the, can, uh, the diseases into subtypes before we are able to really uh, uh, have effective prevention and before we are able to have effective treatments. And that is the big essential step of precision and personalized medicine. How can we make a precise molecular subclassification of the commonly used disease classifications and then prevent them more effectively and treat them more effectively? So people are saying, well, are we not then already practicing precision medicine? Because in a way, medicine is all about individualized treatment. So you have a patient and, and, and you treat the patient in an individualized way. Pathologists would say that, well, I look at every specimen, I do gene tests, immunostainings and so forth. And is, am I not then practicing precision medicine? And researchers may say, well, we've established a biobank, so we are in the precision medicine era. But what is typically missing is this disease concept, disease classification. What is missing are the reference data where you can compare your patient with, with all the other patients that have been previously diagnosed. And, and therefore, uh, we are not having effective predictive and preventive approaches, and we are maybe not having follow-up and monitoring of patients in a way that we could in, the, in, in, in today. And in a sense, then people say, well, this is about genome sequencing. This is uh, not only about genome sequencing. The elements where we, what we need to truly practice precision medicine are very wide. So there's a lot of things that go into this this, this concept that I showed in the previous slides. We have a number of technologies, we have a number of capabilities that help us to practice precision medicine. And I will illustrate a couple of these uh, uh, to you. But what's the bottom line? Why are we doing this? Why do we want to do it? Let's, let's, let's say this uh, way. So first of all, we want to achieve the best possible health care for individuals. And that's what the mean of uh, 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 or the average medicine sometimes fails to do because people are individuals and the treatment may not always suit them uh, optimally. We want to also achieve better cost-benefit uh, ratio for the healthcare, and obviously this is a huge concern as the population is aging and healthcare costs keeps skyrocketing. In the U.S., they are already 20% of the GDP goes to healthcare. And then what we uh, think that this will help is uh, the, uh, to promote uh, better treatments and better diagnostics being brought to the market and therefore helping the patients. So we think that the R&D that the industry does can significantly benefit from precision healthcare. So this is for everybody. This is for the patients. This is for people and individuals who are not yet sick. This is for the healthcare organization, and this is for the industry, and we all should work together. So, um, there are lots of definitions on what is personalized or precision medicine. The first one, or the classical one that you hear from the textbook, is the right drug to the right patient at the right time and the right dose. So, that's perfectly fine, but it's a rather narrow and, and medicine and drug-centric view on precision medicine. Uh, Leroy Hood has coined the term P4 medicine, which is predictive, preventive, personalized and participatory medicine, which is great because it really expands the scope and brings important aspects like the fact that this is preventive and that you need participation from the patient and the, and the person. What I like uh, also is a, a UCSF definition 
where uh, they have uh, uh, said it in a way that precision medicine aims to collect, connect and apply vast amounts of scientific research, data and information about our health to understand why individuals respond differently to treatments and help guide precise predictive medicine. This is important because it brings the big data into the picture. So, so in many ways, a, a, a sort of a, a, a kit can have many names and precision medicine has many definitions, but it's a really about this fundamental major change underway now in the very beginning of it for healthcare research and also uh, industry. But as much as I say that, oh, let's do it and it's already underway, I fully understand that we need to be aware of the fact that nothing happens quickly in medicine. So, so we are having all sorts of exciting ideas on the research side, but translating them to everyday physician uh, uh, and, and healthcare life is obviously a very difficult process, and it takes time. So this is a 10-year process, 50-year process, maybe a 100-year process before we are fully there. It's part of the development of medicine in general, I would say. So, uh, I could quote a number of different approaches on what, how precision medicine goes forward. Uh, it's typically done in cancer, as an early example. It's typically done in rare diseases, and we have Anna Videl in the audience, who is a world-leading expert in, in applying these tools for rare diseases. So, I will now switch a bit more towards the cancer side and illustrate the way that we have uh, uh, set up precision medicine approaches in, in cancer and in a way that, that we hope that actually brings things to the clinic. So many people think that cancer treatment is about gene sequencing and understanding mutations that drive cancer and based on those mutations you ass assign treatments to patients and then uh, practice precision medicine. I'll uh, say a few words about that, and, and that is perfectly fine, and that is the, the, the mainstream uh, precision medicine today. What we have wanted to, to promote is systems medicine uh, for uh, precision, systems medicine approach for this, and that means that we are not only looking at mutations and DNA, but we look at expression of genes, we looked at proteins, we look at images, and we try to undertake functional testing of cancer cells for their uh, sensitivity to the cancer drugs that we try to apply in the, in, the, in the clinic. And as I said, this is about team science. This is not just about an individual group deciding to practice uh, uh, precision medicine. In order to change healthcare, we need to collaborate. And, and this has been the, the way that we have uh, set it up, so close collaborations with clinicians cancer treating clinicians. We need the omics, genomics and other uh, uh, toolboxes that, for instance, SciLife Lab can provide. We need a lot of bioinformatics understanding. We obviously need all our bi biomedical understanding. And then we need to work with the clinicians, with the clinical laboratories. We need to work with the companies that are involved in this uh, field and, and promote clinical trials. And, and essentially, bringing all of these things together is the challenge for the future. Uh, there are ethical, legal and regulatory aspects that we need to careful, be careful about. And, and as I said, this is about team science and increasingly we would like this to be a real-time approach. Not such as we have today, that it takes five to ten years to develop a new diagnostic and bring it to market or it takes 15 years to develop a new therapeutic or a new drug and bring it to market. The life cycle and, and, uh, and progress in, in, in uh, medicine is often in, uh, very uh, slow. Um, so these are just the, the uh, uh, collaborations between uh, research group, but this is also collaborations between universities, hospitals, and institutions. So a lot uh, part of these collaborative sites are, are from our research in, in Helsinki, but they are now being expanded to, to uh, Sweden as well. And as I said, a number of companies are participating in these efforts as well, because you need to bring the companies along in order to get drugs to be tested and, and get, get uh, information from, from their side. So the way that we have set up 
the, the approach that, that uh, we call precision medicine, which is individualized systems medicine, is that we uh, try to help patients who have already undergone all the regular treatments for cancer patients that are available, but nothing has helped them. So in a sense, these are hopeless cases where medicine, according to the, to the, to the uh, current regimens that are being applied, is not helping anymore. Essentially, these are, uh, these are patients where, where nothing has worked. And what we do is to take a sample from them. These are mostly hematological cancers where we have uh, uh, started with this approach. We do genome sequencing, we do transcriptomic sequencing, we do proteomic analysis on them, and we try to establish cells from these uh, uh, patients and do drug sensitivity testing to really understand what drugs might work, what drugs might not work, and understand the biology of the disease in that patient, understand the drug sensitivities and resistance patterns in that patient, and feed that information back to the treating clinician who may choose to, to make use of this to treat the patient, but the treatment decisions are obviously always at the clinician's uh, uh, discretion. So this is a systems medicine approach where we integrate data, do repeated sampling and feedback uh, information, and there is a lot of that information. So obviously clinicians will not be able to handle this, we need to prioritize it, we need to integrate it, we need to interpret it, and this is a huge challenge that we are just learning how to do it at the level of N of 1, because it's a one patient that we not try to interpret, and feed that information back to the clinic in a, uh, in, a, in a clinically meaningful time frame, meaning a few days to a few weeks. So it's a huge challenge, and we are not really uh, fully able to do it, but what has turned out to be remarkably quick and, and something that clinicians feel uh, that, that is helping them is uh, drug sensitivity testing. So we take the cells from the leukemias, we place them in culture, and we expose the uh, cells to 540 different drugs. And we read the response of the cells to each of these drugs. So essentially we generate hundreds of dose response curves for each of the drugs. These drugs are uh, such that they are already indicated for clinical treatment. And there are a number of drugs that are in the developmental pipelines of the pharmaceutical industry or even in the preclinical phase. Those we will not be able to use for patient treatment, but with those drugs we can collaborate with the pharma to design um, uh, uh, pipelines towards the clinical uh, entry and towards clinical application in specific uh, indications. What we are also doing is to look at sort of a selective toxicity of the cells, comparing cancer responses to normal bone marrow, in, in, and in that way, trying to see really what would benefit the patient and not be toxic to the patient. So in, the, in that way, we can uh, assemble towards the clinicians a simple list of drugs that we think or we predict could be useful for patient treatment. And then we can predict a number of drugs that turn out to be less effective on the cancer cells than they are on normal bone marrow, and therefore they might only cause side effects, and we should avoid uh, treating patients with those. So has this really worked? I'll give you a couple of highlights on how this has helped us to bring drug development forward. One example published a couple of years ago in, in, in Nature was that we found axitinib, which is a renal cancer, VEGFR inhibitor, angiogenesis inhibitor, so we found this uh, molecule to score for uh, efficacy in, in these tests, and a couple of uh, uh, leukemias showed up highly sensitive, to be highly sensitive to axitinib, a drug which is never used for leukemia treatment, but is only indicated for use in renal cancer treatment. And this turned out to be, uh, uh, with molecular analysis, we could identify that these are the so-called PCR able positive leukemias, that have been treated with ABL inhibitors, have formed resistance to ABL inhibitors, have a particular gatekeeper mutation with them, and what this mutation does to the uh, ABL protein is to change its conformation in a way that axitinib is all of a sudden active. So, so a renal cancer drug becomes a leukemia drug, 
an, an, an understanding and, a, and an observation that was not previously known. An important thing is not only to look at the molecular mechanisms, but then would this work in the clinic? And with the approach that we had undertaken and a, and a setting to do this, we could test this drug. It's clinically approved, there is no toxicity issues, we could get a permission to apply this drug to the patient, and in a, in a monotherapy given to the patient, we could achieve complete remission in such a drug-resistant leukemia case. And this is now being promoted and, and push, pushed forward for in clinical trials to be approved for this indication. And another example that I'll just quickly show is a simple old drug, dexamethasone, corticosteroid. Uh, this shows also efficacy in a number of uh, leukemias, in this case acute myeloid leukemias. And uh, a patient with showing such sensitivity given dexamethasone actually achieves complete remission. This is not used for AML treatment today, and it's something that clinical trials are now uh, needed to show and prove this formally for, for clinical indications. We've also done similar studies in ovarian cancer, uh, where uh, late-stage ovarian cancer patients produce ascites in the, in, the, in the abdominal cavity, and we can use these cells. And, and to cut a long story short, we've been able to work with, with clinicians to bring uh, advanced ovarian cancer patients to remission and long-term remission by adjusting therapies using the approach that I just uh, showed. So many people are always asking, well, this has been tested a long time ago. There are reports in the 1970s about drug sensitivity testing. Why would it work now and why did it not work before? And this is an, a, a concept that is recurring in the literature, that we, we abandon technologies that, and, and fail to bring them on uh, in, in today's perspective. So in those days, many people, including many people in Sweden, were testing this approach. Uh, uh, and, and the approach was typically done in solid tumors, chemotherapeutic agents, the cultures were in those days not representative. There's a few drugs were tested, no molecular data was available, and today almost everything, I don't have time to go into this, but almost everything is different. We use different technologies, we can integrate it with all of the other omics tools that we have available, and, and we can analyze patients in, in great deal going forward. So we think this is highly promising and is something that, that could, could help clinicians in the future as well. But today we already have shown that this helps the industry to bring, bring drugs to new indications and bring existing drugs to, to uh, new things. Let me then switch topics a little bit to, to diagnostics. So this was about finding new ways of, of uh, uh, defining uh, new treatments, and, and, and uh, this is about pathology and molecular pathology. We think that this is another area where precision technologies could dramatically change the things that uh, are happening today. So today, pathology is done that an ex expert pathologist trained for, for many years looks at specimens, interprets it, and, and gives a subjective opinion, which sometimes varies a little bit from person to person, about what happens at the microscopic level in a, in a tissue, such as in cancer. And what we want to do is to make it more quantitative still have pathologists as the key uh, people making the decisions, but having this based on, on, on uh, digital uh, technology. So digital microscopy is coming to revolutionize our, our uh, microscopic technologies. We can today scan a slide, microscope slide with digital scanners at high resolution and make it a football-sized digital image out of it. So, hundreds of gigabytes of, of uh, image data. And this is something that Johan Lundi at, at FIM, together with his uh, spin-off company, has, has generated. And then bring artificial intelligence on top of this. So this deep learning approach is already applied very broadly. You can use photographs and computers can recognize what's actually in a photograph. So in the future, the same thing can be uh, done for pathology, identifying the various components in a picture, and making a, an objective interpretation of them. So this is an, an example of a testicular cancer slide. Uh, uh, the tumor was 1.6 uh, centimeters in size, and, and this was subjected to such a computerized analysis by Johan and his colleagues. This is now zooming into the picture, and you see this is a 
a, a, a high magnification image and every possible cell in this whole slide has been analyzed. So the computer has indicated that there are 768,349 infiltrating uh, immune cells in that section. Think about pathologists ever counting those cells. That would take quite a lot of time. Uh, what we can uh, also think that this hematoxylin eosin is maybe not the appropriate stain for the future. Hematoxylin was actually invented in 1502, but it's still used in, in the routine uh, uh, diagnostics today. But we think that we should have specific molecular stains applied uh, to cancer and combine it with this digital uh, imaging. And, and this is really what can be done today, and these images that we can create are far more informative than the h &E stains, and they can be combined with this uh, digital uh, imaging so that we can calculate precisely on what types of cells are present in a particular cancer. And this is precision molecular pathology for the future. Now, as my last uh, point, uh, I wanted to bring uh, things more towards the prevention. As you uh, uh, got from the introduction, precision medicine is not only about treating disease. The biggest contribution that I think in the long run we can make is to prevent disease. So how do we do that and what's the point here? And let me now bring a little analog here. So how do we maintain the health of our cars? and compare that to the maintenance of health of people. So with cars, you have a um, thousand sensor reads, readouts per second. You have alarms about acute problems. You have a warranty, extended warranty. You have annual uh, maintenance. You have mandatory inspections. You have recalls for problems. And at the end, all cars are at least supposed to be the same. Well. What about this guy? This, this phenotype may be somewhat familiar to you uh, from, from your neighborhood, maybe. Uh, he has no health sensors, no alarms of acute problems, no warranty, a maximum one health checkup per 10 years, no mandatory inspections, no recalls, and, and, and these people are all different. So isn't this a dramatic difference how well we take care of our cars and how poorly we take care of the health of people? So I'm not saying that we should go to the extreme and have a monitoring system on all the time for everything, but somewhere in between these two extremes, we should consider preventive approaches. So uh, many people have obviously thought about this, and this is a, a big field in itself. Uh, I like this particular graph because it indicates that we have kind of a health status which we could try to understand better at the molecular level. Then we have non-health, which is always reversible, that you can bring it back. And then you have disease, which sometimes is curable, sometimes it's not curable. And therefore, the more that we could deal with this non-health and revert people back the better we could uh, treat uh, uh, disease in the future. So this is personalized health, this is personalized medicine on this side. So we and many others have started now to undertake pilot studies where we, could put, where we try to put all of the tools that we have available for monitoring health, not monitoring disease treatment like I showed in the previous slide. This is our study that we started two or three years ago in, in, in Finland, where we took uh, people for a 16-month a, a um, uh, kind of a intensive monitoring. 100 people. We did questionnaires, health checkup, clinical labs, genomics, proteomics, saliva samples, gut microbiota samples. We tried to take the digital footprints. We equipped them with all the sensors that you can buy today to monitor their, their life. So essentially, all the tools that you can, you can get to, to use it. And, and this is an, an, an approach that is still underway. But we essentially cover most of these topics that I indicated belong to the, to the uh, uh, precision. Medicine. I don't have time to go th through this in detail. And, and this is a similar study like what Leroy Hood has been undertaking. Matthias Ulen is, is running here uh, together with Gothenburg in the, as part of the SCAPIS project. 
a similar effort and Mike Snyder. So there are at least these four studies underway uh, where, where similar approaches are being applied. And we are just in the very beginning of analyzing the data and we haven't even done all the profiling of it, but we did this 16 month monitoring, got uh, 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 20,000 samples from the people. And uh, essentially, uh, just looking at the clinical parameters, uh, we can see that people have all sorts of health alarms. And this was an unselected group of people from the occupational health clinics. We excluded people with serious diseases like cancer and heart disease. Uh, and, and what we could uh, identify is quite a few people, for instance, that have a body mass index which is higher than it should be, 37%. Many have issues with blood pressure, many have cholesterol issues, many have low vitamin D, some issues with hemoglobin, some with higher blood glucose. So if you count them all together, 68% of people had some health alarms lighting up in a way. They are not, I'm not saying that they are sick, but they have issues. And uh, at the end of this 16-month uh, uh, period, we actually uh, gave them guidance and, and, and training and all sorts of things. We were able to reduce it to 58%, and we would actually now like to continue to, to, uh, to uh, do that. And then also monitor at the molecular level what is, what is happening, and essentially this would be the future intervention style uh, healthcare studies that we could do in the future. So some people achieved quite a few decreases of their, their values. And, and at the molecular level, we have, for instance, looked at thousand proteins, we looked at thousand metabolites, we have done all sorts of analysis on these patients and, and have plenty of data on them to, to analyze them in great detail to understand really how could we monitor health of people? How could we diagnose the non-health status earlier before disease actually gets underway? And I will finish with this slide, which I think is a wonderful slide about the future of personalized health maintenance. This is by Eric Topol, uh, uh, published in Cell a couple of years ago, and it shows how, how healthcare is going to be dependent and how we have a lot of opportunities to collect health from our body and, and, and uh, uh, be it at the, at the level of the, of the genomic speed, at the level of a molecular, but also all sorts of imaging and biosensors and our social life, they all impact on our health and we should be prepared that this type of information is available, this type of information could be utilized and we will have a lot of big data available to, to help di uh, diagnose disease before it gets going and also then monitor disease as it's being uh, diagnosed.